fans and welcome back to the Demon Land podcast. My name is Andy. And while the D's have lost their second game on the trot and alarm bells are starting to ring at Demon Land, this week we come up against a team on the ropes with their season on the line. It is a match we just simply cannot lose. Or can we? Joining me tonight after passing his fitness test is George, fresh off an overseas jaunt. Welcome back to the Demon Land podcast, George. Good evening, Andy. Good evening to be, uh, Bin Man. Good evening to all the Demon Land listeners. It's good that the selection committee has had faith in me to allow me to return. Uh, I, I, when I was overseas, I witnessed the passion of uh, Napoli winning the uh, Serie A in Italy. Uh, they nearly burnt the whole town down. I think one died and a few were injured. And the whole town looked like uh, it was Baghdad on the opening night of um, the Gulf War. So um, I don't know that Demonland uh, listeners can even get that p- uh, passionate about it. But uh, let's see what happens out of this this uh, tonight and what they have to say. Well, well, you must never have been to Demonland after a loss because <laughs> it's a virtual town burning uh, when that when that happens. Yeah, well, the- this was after a win. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe if we ever win at the G- grand final day at the G. Also joining us tonight to provide a positive spin on the current fortunes and forms of our great club is Bidman. Good evening, Bidman. Good evening, Andy. Good evening, George. Welcome back. Great to have you and have you back on board. And uh, good evening, Demon Landers. And I'll provide a pos- positive spin about what the um, next few months looks like. Um, not so much positive about... The game, which was a super frustrating game to be at live and um, in part because, you know, our collective hobby horse of the umpiring, it was just appalling umpiring in this game. And it's really it's really frustrating me this season. We've been on the end of, you know, I, I mentioned in the Suns game, I took the opportunity when we won that game to criticise, to, to make it clear that, you know, um, it wasn't the deciding factor in, in, in that result. But it was in this game. It simply was. It was just, it, and, you know, I'm over the standard of the umpiring and um, I'll talk a bit more about it, but also not particularly impressed with uh, Melbourne fans in terms of our ability to influence umpires. So, yeah, um, but, yeah, um, remain uh, positive about where we're heading, that's for sure. Well, each week I ask our loyal listeners to help us out by leaving us a five-star review and a comment on Apple Podcasts or on your preferred podcasting app. We love the feedback or read them out on the show. And so last week I read out a four-star review, B-Man, you'll remember, that we received from a listener and I posited that based on the great comment that perhaps the four stars was a mistake and indeed it was. Uh, You know, the deal has always been that we'll read out any five-star reviews, give a shout-out to the reviewer. Well, Adipetro has indeed adjusted his his rating to five stars. Last week, he said, have been listening to you guys for a number of years and finally became a member of Demon Land last week. Love my Monday nights listening to quality, well thought out observers of our great team. Now, in addition to adjusting the review to five stars, Ada Petro also added, Mia Culpa, could I have not, how could I have not given you five stars as a 65-year-old supporter wearing prism lenses to cure my double vision? I plead guilty. Love listening to the podcast, not once, but twice a week. That's, that's, that's probably about four hours a week if you're doing it twice. Uh, my office <laughs> door... It won't get that back. <laughs> no, definitely not. My, my office door closed pretending to correct students' work or dealing with parents' matters. I quietly have my head down listening intently to the analysis of the game and acknowledging the angst we go through with a loss. Continue with your great passion, guys. So thank you, Adipetro, for the correction and the lovely review. We really do appreciate it. And the five stars does go a long way to boosting the podcast and then in turn getting more people listening to the show and then finding Demon Land. Newport 34, and I wonder if that's um, ex-Demon star Stephen, um, who was a favourite of mine back in the late 80s. Uh, he wore number four, if I recall correctly. Newport 34 says, the best D's podcast. These guys are seriously the best in the business when it comes to analysis and review of D's matches. Essential listening for all Demon fans each and every week. Keep up the good work, Andy, George and Bin Man from yet another Demon Tragic. Thank you, Newey. Much appreciated. And from Facebook, Peter H says, enjoyed the podcast. As always, fellas, I always feel encouraged after a loss and listening to sound reasoning. Same as B-Man, I heard two words out of Gary Lyon and the TV went off. Cheers, boys. 
Well, thanks for your feedback, Peter, and thanks for listening. If you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, you want to leave us feedback or post a question or a comment for the show, you can post under our podcast post each week or just slide into our DMs. We won't read out your full name on the show. If you want to chat with other D's fans and you've never been to our forum, head on over to demonland.com, sign up, and you can chat with other D's fans. It's completely free. In addition to being able to post questions or comments for the show, there are multiple topics and threads on all things demon related. So join up to join in on the conversation if you would like to join us tonight on the air to talk about any of the topics we're going to talk about and there are a lot this week then please give us a call on 0390163666 that's 0390163666 i'll answer i'll put you on mute and i'll bring you on when we can during the week you can give that number a call and leave us a message and we'll play it on the show if you're listening live join us in the chat room by simply heading over on over to demonland.com slash podcast we're live uh, Mondays at 8.30 p.m. If you've downloaded the podcast and want to listen to us live, please join us on Mondays at 8.30 p.m. at demonland.com. Well, it was almost a case of Groundhog Day for the NAM Football Club on Saturday as it took on uh, Wally Yulip. Is that how you say it, George? Um, I, I don't know. You I'm, know, not no, very, I, I, I'm not fluent, not fluent in Noongar. I think it is because <laughs> it's, it's, it's written Wally Yallop, but I think it's Wally Yallop. Um From the West, uh, the equivalent match last season was where things started to go wrong for the club after 17 straight wins that included the 57-year drought-breaking premiership. It was deja, deja, vu, uh, deja vu at the MCG with uh, the Dockers again overcoming a half-time deficit, defeating the Ds on our home turf. Christian Petrarca held up his end of the bargain, as did Tom Sparrow, in filling the cavernous hole left by the absence of Clayton Oliver. But the Demons once again fell apart badly in the midfield. This was especially so after Wally Allop's uh, Sean Darsty was sh- subbed off the ground with a hamstring injury, leading Nams, all Australian ruck duo Max Gorn and Brody Grundy to contend with a previously out of form former Demon Premiership ruckman Luke Jackson. It should have been a ruck mauling, but once again there was a major deficiency in the engine room that led to an anomalous statistic in the takeaway from stoppages. Despite the D's domination of the hitouts 56 to 28, we lost the clearance battle 37 to 39. The Wally Yellup uh, midfield had enough talent and was prepared to work much harder to get their hands on the footy. Andrew Brayshaw and Caleb Sarong busted the Demons open and won the day for the Dockers. The D's defence battled hard to stem the tide in the first half, but the damn wall broke in the third with some sloppy marking in defence and disposal as well. The main problem from the for the D's uh, on the day, though, was the in attack where we were simply dysfunctional. The powerful defensive pressure, which this line once applied, was missing. Inaccuracy as well returned to the side, and the D's squandered a few opportunities in front of the big sticks that might have won them the day. The writing was on the wall last week when Nam succumbed to Yatapulti. Uh, the selectors ignored the signs and the team lost yet again. George, uh, your thoughts on the game and our form in general over the past few weeks while you've been on sabbatical? Uh, uh. As as the listeners might have gathered, um, I didn't see the game live, so I've had the benefit of watching it emotion-free after the event on replay. Uh, But there are a couple of things which which, uh, really stood out for me in particular. Firstly, um, from what I understand, the game against Port Adelaide was was very wet. Um, Was was that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And off a five-day break. Six day, I think. Six, six yeah. day break, and that is just a, a recipe for um, under underperformance from the, from the from the players in particular. Um, it's really hard coming up after these really tough hard games against a team um, that does um, tend to kill um, forward thrusts. Um, uh, it was almost, from what I saw, a, a, an exact repeat of the way that Fremantle beat us last year. They just uh, use this technique that probably Ross Lyon developed better than anyone else. Just kill the opposition, stay in the game, and um, towards the end of the game, you fall over the line by a small margin. Um, if we didn't um, get out to an early lead and make them chase us, we were never going to win that game. But watching the um, watching the replay, the single thing that stood out for me, and, and uh, you know, all the commentary has been about contested possessions and lack thereof and individual players was we missed set shots we had nine set shots that we missed in, in, and also a tenth one where Grundy was running into the um, kicking unimpeded from 
uh, about the 35 metre mark that missed. And they so were all 10, very, they were all very, 10, sorry to interrupt, they were all very gettable. None of them were, yeah, yeah, they were all inside, yeah. inside 50. All these shots were very, and we miss, we've missed the whole lot of them. We only had to kick two or three, you know, two or three of those, particularly in the first quarter, and the game would have been all over. And they, they uh, didn't miss either. <laughs> they they, they did not miss. miss. Of course, yeah. <laughs> the old adage about good kicking wins yeah. matches was never more so in this game. They, the opportunities were there multiple times, multiple times to be able to put the game away and we simply failed to. In the end, we kept them in the game and that's the worst thing you can do to a, a side like that. Um they get their tails up sufficiently. They they didn't beat us around the ground. We were playing much better football than them around the ground. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't but think that they. I didn't think that they were anything flash. Um, no, no, ab so. absolutely. Yeah. So, um, given the circumstances of the previous game, we've seen it before. Um, in in previous years, you get those tough, hard games. You can't come back up. Um, we're probably going to face the same sort of scenario against Carlton this week. You know, the, again, it's coming off a six-day break again. we The players are tired at this at this point in the season. They haven't had the break. And then, you know, coming up against Port Adelaide, who are obviously serious contenders, so it was a tough, hard game last week. Um, short break and in the wet, um, all these factors just worked against us. We still only lost by seven points. Um, um, the, the season isn't open. There's been plenty of um, advice on Demon Land about... Um, uh, where other premiership sides have been at this time in the season, you have to take that into account. There's there's probably probably um, four or five teams that are genuinely pushing for the for the finals, but this year is particularly co competitive. There's of of the uh, teams, there's probably only North Melbourne and probably Hawthorne uh, aren't competitive. Sorry, um, uh, West Coast and North Melbourne aren't competitive. Even Hawthorne proved that on the weekend that they, they can um, turn a game. Um, the other teams in the competition are going to provide a serious comp uh, a serious game for us. There is no there are no certain wins in in this competition this year. It's it really is um, one of the most even even competitions I've seen for many, many years. So um, don't ever write off anybody and um, uh, I think we're going to see it. And the results on the weekend from other games just proved it proved it uh, extensively. You know, people who um, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't have expected Geelong to be losing at, at uh, GMHBA Park or whatever they call it these days um, against the Suns. Um, that was you know, just emblematic of what's going on in the competition at the moment. So for the Demon Land listeners, um, you're going to get some more frustration for the remainder of the season. So, um, uh, But we're, in, we're still in a good position. Um, we might we might not be as well, uh, well off as what we would have liked. We would have liked to repeat what we did last year and the year before, um, but it's not the case this year. The competition's much tighter. Yeah, well, maybe we don't want to be where we were last year. So it's, it's interesting because if you go back to this time last year, people were all papering over, you know, 10-1 is a mirage after this game or 10-zip we came in. So mm. we, we're, we're now 10, oh, last year at this time we were 10-1. Ironically, that's what Collingwood are now, 10-1. Um, yep. And plenty of people on Demon Land were talking about papering over the, the cracks ahead of the game last week. I can't remember, um, George, whether this was when you were on, but uh, when you were away, but I think it might have been when you were away. I, I mentioned that Daniel Hoyne, I think his name is from Champion Data, raised our incredible um, accuracy by foot uh, and flagged that the likelihood is that we'll revert to the mean. And uh, that's what happened. And, and um, you know, on the back of that, we've lost... Um, a couple of games that we we would have won if we kicked at the same sort of accuracy rates we were in the first, say, third of the season. Um, but going back to your point about, you know, uh, where this frames us, say, for a push towards the finals, I went back, this is ahead of the um, of last week's, uh, after last week's game, so I'm not including this game, the win-loss record of the last 10 premiers after round 10 Um 2013 Hawks were 9-1. The 14 Hawks side was 7-3. Hawks in 2015 was 6-4. 2016, the Dogs won it, was 7-3 after 10 rounds. The Tigers in 2017 was 6-4. Um, the Eagles were 9-1 in 2018. Ironically, the massive flag faves all season that year with the Tigers were also 9-1 after 10 games. 2019, the Tigers uh, were 7-3. 
after 10 games. In 2020, when the Tigers won after 10 games, they were six wins, three losses and a draw. Um, in 21, when we won it, um, uh, we were 9-1. But in the next seven games, and this is really important to the discussion framing about how we're travelling, so we were 9-1 after 10 games, but in the next seven games went um, two wins, four losses and a draw, um, much to the chagrin of, <laughs> of Demon Land. And last year, the Cats were 6-4 after 10 rounds. Um, and, you know, it's one of the maxims of football is that there's you follow the lead of the last year's Premier. Well, you know, in many ways, it's exactly what the Cats did last year, exactly. And they said as much in terms of um, their training um, and load management. Um, and I think we're following the lead of the Cats this year. And, um, you know, again, they were 6-4. We're 7-3. Um, we were 7-3 last week. We're now 7-4. Um, uh, so, but 10 seasons, a pretty good sample size. And the pattern's really clear is seven of the 10 winners are no better than 7.30 after 10 rounds. Um, but people are happy to write off the D's premiership chances at round 10 and now round 11 on the back of a four-point loss against... Port, who were coming off six straight wins, they were on their home deck in conditions that suited them better, um, and we were coming off a six-day break. Um, and then, you know, um, you know, in this game as well, they've, this is, I think, their third or fourth win straight. They're definitely um, playing much better. They're running over the ground better now, Frio. Um, and, you know, it's sort of this notion of, you know, people tend to forget the past and then just repeat the same things every year. So, mm. you know, just looking at that, you know, as I said, 10 rounds, uh, 10 years of those results is enough to say there's a pattern there and that, you know, um, you know, the majority of the teams are at least seven, three at the round 10 mark. It's interesting you're talking about um, Geelong and how they managed their players last year and the, the, they were also fortunate with the lack of, uh, physical injuries, but um, I think we're doing. We, we've changed our um, on-ground time for a lot of players uh, compared to last year to follow, like you said, the same pattern that Geelong did. If you looked at last year, um, Ed Langdon, for example, played 100% of every game, virtually every game that he played in, um, and we were depending on uh, you know the Levers and the Mays doing the other 100%. But also our on-ballers were playing a lot more. Um, uh, time on ground. Uh, I'm not sure, but certainly in this game, there seems to be a far, mo far more even spread of time um, uh, amongst the whole playing group. Uh, we're managing in certain individual players. Viney, for example, has very low relatively um, time on ground numbers. I think he was uh, around about 60... 69% or something like that, if I remember, 70%. Most most players should be around about the 80% mark if it was evenly spread amongst everybody. Um, but we're starting to see, um, like I said, when Langdon's and Viney's um, need that extra break in the middle of the year, instead of running them into the ground, trying to win a game, we're, we're aiming, I think, to get them to the end of the season and uh, be more competitive. So it'll be interesting over the next couple of weeks to, to see if that's um, holding up. And the same sort of thing with the younger players. You know, McVie is only playing only played 68% game time um, in this game. That works to a lot of minutes off the ground when you when you really um, uh, spread it around. JVR, only 73% game time. Uh, so, yeah, it'll be interesting. But I think we're actually managing the loads more in-match rather than... Uh, between matches um, than what we did last year. And may, now, maybe now's a good time to play that clip given it sort of where we're discussing that. But just before you do, the um, I'll set it up. But the, it's interesting, George, that you watch that game knowing the result. Um, and I haven't watched a replay. Normally I, I watch a replay of the game um, uh, before the podcast but um, haven't had a chance. So my experience of the game is just from seeing live and my throat's still a bit raspy from the uh, amount of yelling I did and it was such a frustrating game and it really colours your sense of, of what happened. Um, and in large part it was super, super frustrating because our mind-boggling shocking kicks inside 50, you know. we you know So there's the scoring that you mentioned, the shooting for goal, but on top of that there's probably minimum six or seven, don't you think, Andy, where... We've missed a basic kick inside 50 um, and, you know, really, really highlighted how much 
we missed Hunter. That was a massive out. And, I, you know, I think I fall into the trap of perhaps overestimating the strength of our list. But, min, you know, I, I fall into the trap a little of underestimating the impact of losing key players. And, you know, you'd have to think he would have nailed at least two or three more of those inside 50 kicks. There were some laughable misses inside 50. I mean, there were a couple where they were actually really good kicks, one from Nibbler that um, was going all the way to JVR and some, you know, not, uh, I think Harms put his arm up and intercepted it and it spilled. I mean, and there was, was the fri- there was the Fritch and Spargo uh, oh, spoiled each other. Spark, yeah. um, but it wasn't just the kicks inside 50. How many on the falls did we kick? Uh, exactly. And that could have been so pressure kicking, related, yeah. but um, yeah. Yeah, so the kicking skills were were woeful right back down. And the other one, of course, I mean, um, you know, Oliver, you take Oliver out of that side. It's the first game he's missed in how many, Andy? Well, he missed one last year with a broken thumb, but, oh, yeah, he oh, hasn't okay, missed many. True, yeah, yeah, so he's probably played, you know, that's the only second game he's missed in what, yeah, five uh, seasons yeah. or something. Um, and, you know, obviously goes without saying he is huge, um, um, you know, how do you replace Oliver? No. Um, so, but I think Hunter's out was was as significant. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, and I, it's interesting you raised about um, how they kicked the way in some respects. Or uh, after Darcy went off, I actually think it helped them. Um, oh, Jackson's absolutely. best role was as a full time ruckman, and he was so much more damaging once he was released into the ruck and and had a you know had a good game. And um, has to be said. So this clip. Is, it's a long one, but it, it sort of goes to the points that George were, was touching on. Um, it's from our interview with Selwyn Griffith early in the year, and and really it's about the issue of fatigue. Um, you know, for I, I won't go into it in, in great detail, but for listeners new to the podcast who who um, weren't listening this time last year or, or the, this time the previous year. Um, uh, my my take on the the loading is that around this period of time, um, there's a two to three week, potentially longer, maybe three to four, but I'm I'm landing on about three weeks of increased training loads that um, has a um, significant impact on fatigue, in game fatigue, and is a big factor in um, uh, our mid season slump, if you want to call it, which happened in 21, happened in 22, and this exact same corresponding game last year, as Andy said at the top. Um, we struggled in. I fully expect that we will struggle on Friday night against the Blues and it'll be another scrappy game for the same reason. Um, you know, whether whether the loading is a factor, what is 100% a factor, and this is really picked up in what Selwyn talks about in this next clip, is that regardless of, of the impact of increased load, there's no question that the fatigue of playing this to this point in the season really starts to um, have a massive impact on the, the team. He doesn't talk about it in this clip, but just a reminder of the incredibly tough travel schedule that we've had um, in this first half of the year and the impact it has um, on preparation and, and um, things like sleep and diet and those elements. Um, Do- uh, 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 do you want to, before I play it, do you want to just explain to any new listeners who aren't familiar with the term loading, what, uh, just a little bit, uh, an, an intro to it? Uh, yeah, and, and he, the he talks why about they it a little it? bit yeah. here, I think. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, he probably clarifies it here, but it, essentially it's um, the goal being, being cherry ripe, is to be cherry ripe come grand final day and in optimal shape, probably prelim day. Um, they do a in um, a massive block of training in January, February to get fuel in the tank to get basically to the halfway point of the season, uh, and then they've got to top up that tank. And um, he makes the point, Selwyn Griffith, is that they can't do any aerobic work once the season starts, um, and then they have to manipulate their time around the buy and the breaks, which we're really shafted in the last couple of years around that, um, to be able to get the aerobic work in to fill the tank back up so that come finals, um, um, we're in optimal shape. My own perspective is all teams do it to a greater or, or an extent, but we've, um, Burgess, I think, has really driven this. Cats follow Burgess's path. I think our advantage in fitness is definitely now not what it was, and that's um, that's a big factor in, you know, the 
coming back to the field a little bit, I have to say. Um, but the reality is that, you know, the team's outside the eight and, you know, Frio's interesting because they will have given up on their dream of top four. So they won't be needing to go hard to be at their optimal shape in mid-September. They'll just be wanting to get as many wins just to scrape into the finals. Um, so, you know, my sense is that there's every chance that either the fatigue from the season's already here or they've commenced their, their increased middle-of-the-year training block. So, the, you know, and a three-week three period of increased load to get the aerobic, um, to fill up the tank, the aerobic tank again. They also do power um, and to basically get us through so we're in optimal shape. And I think the important thing about, about the impact of the fatigue is not to think of these last two games because it's incredible, you know, that neither are a litmus test on our on our chances of winning a flag, but it's incredible when that becomes the focus, the last two games. No one was talking about our inability to score after the um, Hawthorne game. We flogged them. Everyone was talking about the historically high number spread of goal kickers. Um, you know, two weeks in footy and suddenly, you know, we're, we're back to the pack seems to be the narrative. But the easier thing or the better thing to do is to look to our first three games. And go, that's when we're optimally fresh. We've done the loading and they've tapered into the season. So our tank is at its fullest. We're the most, we're in optimal shape in rounds one, two, three, four, five. And go back if you're wondering what our finals game plan is going to look like and watch those games again, because that's the model that we'll be looking to um, play in the finals, not this model that we struggle. So in this game, for instance, everyone goes, oh, Melbourne's going back to at this old style of bombing it in, just bombing it in. There's no attack. There's no flair. If you can't, um, if you're fatigued, you cannot get the multiple runners. Uh, you cannot run into space. You can't uh, have players leading up for the pass. That's what enables the, the ball to tic-tac go on the ground and create space, and that's what provides uh, leading lanes and space in the forward line, um, and that's what a, a allows our game plan to flourish. It's the same deal for the Pies. Um, and this is not a phenomena that's just for Melbourne. Look at what's just happened on the weekend. Eight finals teams, uh, sorry, four finals teams um, were beaten by teams outside the eight. I mean, this is not an anomalous random result. The same thing happens last, last year. The quality of the games collapses. You watch it. The games were terrible over the weekend. Um, Brisbane um, got, you know, so four teams, the Suns, the Demons, um, the Dogs, uh, and who am I missing, uh, got beaten. Uh, the uh, Lions got beaten by a team inside the eight, but just inside the eight, um, and a team coming off in the Crows being flogged um, last week by the Dogs, um, and I'm missing the fourth one. So The sorry. Cats. You meant the um, Cats instead of the Suns. Uh, the cats, and the Cats got rolled by the Giants at their home ground um, at a, where they've got like a 90% winning rate. Uh, you know, the reigning premiers... And I watched that game and it was the standard in that game was appalling. You would not think that you're looking at a premiership side. And that's clear what was happening. I mean, when you take your glasses off and look at it, that was fatigue. There's, there's no way in any other circumstance that the, the Giants are going to win that game of footy down at Cabinia Park. Um, so it's not just us, it's the other clubs as well. And fatigue exacerbates our existing issues, particularly ones related to, um, you know, our skill execution. Um, before I play the clips, the Giants have actually beaten uh, the Cats at Cardinia Park the last three times they've played them. Yeah, and I'll bet <laughs> I, I'll be really curious. Yeah, so forget, I'll bet you though that's all in the middle of the season without having looked at them. But I would be very, oh, you know, so um, they've got a good record down there. So yeah, <laughs> I'll play the clip. <laughs> in terms of go on. Oh, that's you. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were talking, and it is you. The need to have a premiership contending team, so like a, a team with a genuine, you know, internally they think they're a genuine shot at winning the flag. Um, in terms of having such a team in optimal shape fitness-wise come grand final time, what does the uh, the training program look like over, say, the January to end of December, so like a 12-month period? Yeah, well, obviously our pre-season period um, is is a big component for us to build our aerobic foundation and our consistency of, of high speed and high power. Now, the difference between pre-season as we, and then once we transition into February, March, is they're not having to recover from uh, the contact elements of the game and uh, the unpredictable. Like we're still obviously doing some forms of match simulation and contest in training, but 
the transition from that into in season, you're pretty much uh, getting 70% of your overall load in season from the game. And then the rest of that is made up of um, your training in, in, the, in the week. The one constraint that uh, is, is tricky since COVID is uh, our, our game turnarounds. And this year it's better because we get the first 15 rounds really clearly identified. And so you're able to look at when we have our shorter turnarounds and longer turnarounds. But the last couple of years where the AFL has held off the, the schedule, you, you are really, um, you struggle to plan forward what the ideal um, training structure is because you do need to uh, respect um, the accumulation of fatigue based on turnarounds, travel, these sorts of things, you know, to highlight the fact that we, after Sunday's game, we go into a seven-day turnaround, we travel to Perth and we are on a six-day turnaround into um, gather round in Adelaide with a back-to-back travel. So those sorts of things constrain um, how much training you can do and those are the main manipulations that happen between now and and September, uh, the, the, you have to look um, at certain times where you can increase some of that training stimulus because uh, obviously with such a long season, um, as I mentioned before, you, if your aerobic fitness being such an important element, the, the game doesn't actually train your aerobic fitness system because it is so variable for different individuals. So you need to look for periods within the season that you can get some pure um, aerobic conditioning into the group to maintain or, or just even to try to still elevate that that capacity for some individuals throughout a season. And that's the, the unique balance um, within a year when you only have one mid-year buy and, and one end-of-season buy if you're, if you're coming into September. So, yeah, it's it definitely um, probably one element is, is, you know, looking at um, how we're rotating players both in-game and then throughout the season, um, you know, being cognizant of, of our playing list and how we can uh, continue to manage their fitness and fatigue across the year. And with the addition of an extra season, uh, an extra game, that's something that we've definitely discussed internally. But, uh, you know, with only being two rounds down, you, you're having those conversations um, about just being mindful of it. But obviously only two rounds in will... Where, you know, we haven't accumulated a huge amount of fatigue just yet. Um, it's more as we progress through through the season. That sort of actually leads perfectly into the next question. Just from watching the footage, you know, the training footage and reading the reports, the training reports and what the players talk about, that January and February is a really, you know, a heavy loading phase for the players that, as you said, sets them up 70% of, of their load for the year. Does the team do another loading phase during the season? And if so, when and how long is that block of training? Yeah, we're looking at that at the moment. And that's where the mid-year period and the buy, you know, you, you look for those periods or you look in in, in an around period where you have nine or ten day breaks. Um, but once again, that's all dictated to you by what you've done in the season two weeks because you as I mentioned before, you need training consistency. So if we've gone off the back of, for example, a six and a five day turnaround, you can guarantee that in those two weeks, we've had a reduction in training volume because we just haven't been able to train too much. So then if, if we add um, a substantial amount of volume the following week, that may have uh, some benefit on, on a fitness element, but does it also um, possibly put an injury risk element within that because of the lack of consistency and that that's the battle it, this year unfortunately you don't really get a true buy um if you guys have looked at the schedule we, we pretty much get three nine or ten day turnarounds so we play four games in five weeks in that mid-year period so that's where we're currently planning around where we can get uh, an increased exposure in some of our aerobic uh, capacity development but also respecting that throughout that period between, you know, rounds 12 and 15 or 16, it's probably a period where the boys are also feeling physically and mentally um, fatigued. So we've also got to understand that um, the game can be uh, yeah, quite hard, both mentally and physically, and, and so there's a balance of offering uh, the playing group um, some uh, recovery from that perspective as well, and that's that, that's that balance of um, finding 
uh, the, the balance of pushing hard enough to, con to continue to develop their capacity while respecting that um, there may be a period that we need to also step it back. That was our interview with uh, Selwyn Griffith. You can find that uh, uh, where you found this podcast. It uh, was early on in the season, probably around round two. Around 12 to 15 makes me nervous because that's exactly where we fell away last year is in those games where fatigue and I'm sort of, in my mind, I'm kind of hoping that we've we've started that loading. It was interesting. You said you can't do any loading when those breaks and they didn't have enough between um, the Port game and potentially this one. We've now got a nine-day break, oh, sorry, a um, eight-day break, haven't we, into the Blues game? Yeah, it's nine no, days, seven. I think, yeah, uh, from Friday to Monday. Yeah, to the Friday, to the – so I'm hoping that – I'm hoping like every other fan that we are totally in optimal shape for the Pies, but there's every chance, you know, that, you know, this time last year we played the Pies and we weren't. So, you know, that's that round 12 to 15 that he's talking about. But, you know, a, a really interesting um, take on the impact of fatigue. So then maybe we haven't started that block of additional aerobic training, um, but that that idea that he raised I thought is a really interesting one of this uh, – concept of accumulated fatigue you know thinking that it gets it gets worse and worse as the season approaches the midway um, stage but as george mentioned there we are doing some stuff in game differently this year that we did than we did last year so perhaps that may have some um, effect in in the positive hopefully yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also it doesn't look like they've done it very often this year, but um, Goody did talk about using the sub as a, um, another sort of lever to do load management. Um, I don't know whether that's happened so far because it's always been short unless they're managing his load. Yeah, well, they've, you know, you've still got to sort of keep an eye on injuries as well so you don't want to pull the trigger too soon on, on a sub um, in a game. And, and I mean, look, the, the whole loading thing is a, it's somewhat of a fur fear. The fatigue is the issue. And so whatever the cause of the fatigue is, you could see that the players' fatigue re results in kicking, but you could see that right across the competition. There were some horrible games of footy this week and some horrible turnovers. And when you look at the other teams that are playing and, you know, you take off your demon glasses, you go, oh, geez, that's, how, you know, horrible. What are they doing? I'm watching Port Adelaide Richmond. They they could not miss a target against us, Port, but they were butchering the ball except for um, Butters and Pal Pepper against the Tigers. Um, B-Man, I know that you thought the podcast was tomorrow night. I'm not sure. Did you prepare anything for stats uh, or do you want to go to straight to listeners' questions? Uh, just I'll run through the stats. I've got this, the key stats from this game. Uh, just bear with me. So interestingly, just on that that discussion of fatigue, our first quarter was keeping in mind um, uh, 180 is AFL average and 200 is considered elite. Uh, in that first quarter, it was 200 um, points, pressure points to 177 our way. Second quarter, and this really looked like it at the ground and that's how it felt, such a dispiriting second quarter, 164 our pressure dropped to mm. in the second quarter. Um, they increased theirs from 177 to 198. Third quarter, same sort of story. We came out, I was hoping we'd come out breathing fire, 178 the pressure rating was, so under AFL average, bang on elite for them at 200. Last quarter it was impressive in terms of our um, fight and effort. Um, I didn't watch the live coverage, but someone said to me at one point um, both of clubs were around 230 or something on that pressure yeah. rating. Was that on the coverage, George? Yes, it was, yeah, 235, I think, Um uh, through in the last quarter, it was Sorry. incredible. You know, it's um, so yeah, be prepared for next week when two teams are playing like that. It is a hard pressure game, yeah, and, exactly. And uh, it always drops away. And keeping in mind, we had a huge pressure game last week, so yeah. our numbers were higher. We averaged 197 last week, it's gonna take it out of you. There's no yeah. question. In the fourth quarter, we were pretty impressive still. They were more impressive, so credit to Port. The 215 they averaged for that quarter, 197 pressure ratings for us. The total was 198 to them, just under elite, 185 for us, just above AFL average. And, and for me, that, that tells a big tale. Last week, we talked about the same issue. It's completely related to fatigue. Um, the individual pressure um, uh, ratings, our top players were Harmsey, who was 61, that's what the eyes told me as well. He was um, both clearly our um, best pressure player. Interestingly, coming you know after a few games at VFL level, 
um, which is a lower intensity. Viney next on 59, um, Captain Jack Sparrow on 58, Petrarca on 53, Neil Bullen on 45, Salem on 41, May on 40. And why it's interesting or why this tells me a lot about fatigue is that the next player, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, is Rivers way down there, a younger player on 34. And then we dropped to McVie on 32 and Chandler who got subbed out on 32. So our younger players are really struggling. It seems to me Cozzy's struggling at the moment with the fatigue and um, Sparks as well. Time moving forward half looked much like how we want it to look. Um, 56% our way to 44%. Thanks for Wheelows on this. He's done calculations, not official. Um, he's taking notes during the game, which is super helpful for time in forward half for each quarter. 60-40 our way in the first quarter, 48-52 their way in the second, 46-54 in the third. Um, but this was quite amazing. I was surprised. 67-33 our way in the last, which really shows we kept fighting and we'd had our chances in the last quarter, which partly why is so frustrating. I kept on. I really expected us to get over the line in that game. Big, big number for D's, which was a big tick. Um, contested possessions, 157 to 141. So 16 more contested possessions is a big, big um, uh, key performance indicator for the D's. We talked about scoring um, before um, George mentioned it. They only had 11 more points from their clearances. So that whole discussion about their clearance domination, I guess Darcy went off. But, you know, as we also talked about, Jackson did a good job when he did go off. Um, but the big key number really from my perspective was scores from turnover were only 37, 5, 7, 37 to their 4, 4, 28, meaning we only scored nine more points from our most important important scoring um, source. That's our key scoring source. Um, mind you, if we instead kick 7-5 from turnover, we score another 10 points than we would have and we win that game. Um, and on that point, there's two key related stats. Port were 9-3, as George talked about before, 9-3-57 from their set shots and we were 4-7-31. That's a 26-point differential from set shots. We didn't have that many more difficult ones. We missed some um, gimmies, absolute gimmies, um, and that's not even mentioning the out on the full from um, around the ground. But, you know, 26 more points from set shots the game. This is really uh, that jumped out at me from the stats. The expected score um, was plus 18 our way. Um, and why I found that really interesting, one, is that that's, um, you know, I wonder the value of, of that stat. However, here's an interesting um, thing on what where the club sees the value. An expected score, as I've talked about before, I can see where I sit um, with my binoculars. I can see what they write on their boards that they bring out to the um, players to show them at quarter time. And I've mentioned this before about at the top's always contested possession and time in forward half. Um, on the board this week at the end of the first quarter, they were two and three um, on the uh, list on the first line this week, which is something I've not seen before, either at the um, uh, in the AFL games or when I've gone to Casey and gone out to the huddle at quarter time. The top line on um, this time was expected score plus 15 at the end of the first quarter. Um, and I, as I said, I hadn't seen that before. Um, it tells me, you know, you've got a message. They've got Goody wants to give a message to the players. The number one message that he wanted to make it clear to them at the end of the first court thing is the expected score is plus 15, stay at it. Um, ended up plus 18. So we won the rest of the game on expected score by plus Can 13. you just explain what expected score is? I can. They, they, <laughs> it's a, a calculation. They look at each yeah. kick at goal, including the ones that go out on full. And I think we've talked about it before and I'm, I, you read a tweet, I think, but it's okay. how much pressure they were on, what their record is, from, what the individual player's record is from that shot. Yeah. I think fatigue is factored in in terms of what point of the quarter it is. Um, there's a number of data points they enter to come up with that expected score. But I thought it was really curious that the goody elected to put that on the board to show the players, um, presumably as a psychological thing to say, yeah, you know, we should be further in front. You're doing the right thing. Stick to okay, it. Yeah. Is our yeah. numbers are all tracking in the right way? Um, and I haven't listened to the press. It's the first time I've not listened to the presser. But I presume Goody was saying, look, the game looked like how we a Melbourne game. We just didn't execute. Is you know, I'm not sure if he did say that, but I'm, I'm yeah. pretty. I, I think the base from what I saw it was basically around disposal efficiency. Yeah. Um, both in front of goal and around the ground. Um, he complained bitterly about it. Um, we're not going to win the games if we ki if we kick like that, basically. 
So. Yeah, and personally, I think, you know, that's one of our biggest weaknesses. I've talked about this for a long time is our kicking skills. It remains a worry to me, um, uh, you know, and I think that um, as we're, again, we've talked about fatigue exacerbates poor technique. And if you, your starting point is poor technique, you're exhausted, you're going to cough the ball up more, um, which is, you know, I was watching um, Butters yesterday the other issue that I think that, you know, we've talked about the last couple of weeks, which I think is a real issue, is that we just don't have many one-touch players, really. Even our very best players in, you know, Oliver's one-touch, but track often isn't. Um, so even our very best aren't as one-touch in, say, the way Butters is. Again, I watched the Port um, Richmond game and he was phenomenal in the last quarter, under fatigue, in the wet, under pressure. He just totally one-touch and so was um, um, Pal Pepper in that game as well. So. Nudge in the chat room said Goody referenced expected score specifically in his presser. Right, there you go. So, you know, uh, I, one that answered a question, I, was, I always wonder whether that's a stat that they look at. Um, the pressure rating, we talked about this, George, when you were away and, you know, I raised the question whether, you know, whether the club actually use it, or, you know. Um, but Sanderson said um, in on his show on SEN or his half hour on SEN with Waitley that they do, in fact, um, use it and they show the players live during the game at all points where the pressure rating is, um, which is what on that board that I've talked, that video board that I've talked about that I can see as well in the huddle, that's where it's got pressure. That must be what it's indicating. All right. Well, let's get into our listeners' questions unless you've got anything else you want uh, with your stats. Are we done with no. stats? All right, we're done. All right, let's get into right, our- one more stat. One, one more, more stat. stat. All right, we got one more stat. Twenty nine thousand people. Yeah, well, it's just not enough. No, I mean, <laughs> people criticise Melbourne's performance. Fair play. Okay, you want to criticise Melbourne performance, but I hope I don't want to hear any criticism of Mel's performance of anyone who wasn't there who could go there, and I don't mean someone who. It's got a funeral, it's got COVID, it's got mobility issues. You know, I mean, anyone who could go and chose not to go. Um, because, you know, watching the footy over the weekend, in particularly the Richmond game, you know, the, the, there's no question at all is that they, you know, the loud crowd influences the umpire. And there were some appalling non calls in this game that I swear if there were 40,000 people there and 30,000 of, I mean, we're playing Frio for Christ's sake. 30,000 people, uh, Melbourne fans, screaming some of those free kicks would have been paid. It was just remarkable. And I think that, you know, I've, I've not been a critic of Melbourne um, fans for not turning up, but they're the- I mean, we're, we're theatre goers. We turn up for the big games. You know, this game on Friday night against the Blues, I, I, I predict it'll be a scrappy game that I'm, I'll be pleased if we get away with a win. That's the sort of game we need fans to turn up in. We might have won this game. Seriously, we may have won this game if there were 40,000 people there. Um, it might have been the difference. They talk, Players talk about it all the time um, when um, uh, fans make a difference with the volume of noise. You just have to watch the Port Adelaide game when they play at home or Adelaide in this game just gone against Brisbane or, you know, it, it, I think Melbourne fans need to seriously buy a mirror and turn up to the bloody footy. There was the, one. The diff- uh, go ahead. Sorry, the, the difficulty is, been man, that um, Richmond played Port Adelaide and they got thirty thousand. Still louder than us. But, but yeah, so, so the so the what we need is louder people turning up. So you and I and Andy have got to do a better job when we do turn up. Yeah, well, I almost lost my voice screaming at the footy on Saturday, <laughs> so it's why I'm croaky now. But yeah, I mean, I take your point. But they're also fifteenth on the ladder. You could say yeah. the prize game. 70,000 people will turn up for an interstate team. Now, I know they've got double the um, membership and all of that stuff, but Tigers are 15th and, you know, so I don't, and it was raining in a miserable afternoon. Mm. This was a perfect Saturday afternoon at the MCG, 2 o'clock start, 2.10 start. Weather was brilliant. Absolutely no excuses um, for Melbourne fans not to turn up. And I really believe it was a factor in the reason, one of the reasons we lost was um, how, you know, that, not just the low turnout, but how poor they were at supporting their teams in terms of, you know, for God's sake, clapping Jackson. Come on, give me a break. <laughs> talk about that in a minute. Um, there, you talk about noise of affirmation. There was one time we were going to the city end. There was a, it was definitely a holding the ball, and the umpire actually looked like he was about, you know, he had his arms about to give that 
and the, I, I think it was the crowd yeah. wasn't calling ball loud enough and he just, all right, ball up. <laughs> it looked all the world like he was going to and everyone was waiting and then Buddha's like, come on, Dees. And look, to be perfectly honest, it was embarrassing. Embarrassing to be a Melbourne fan mm. to hear how loud the Frio fans were I know, there were 2,000 Frio, Frio fans were d- louder than Melbourne. Yeah. And then as I was Come leaving on. the ground, I, did, I could you hear leaving the ground that free? Oh, they they were they could. loud, and there they couldn't could have been it. more than two thousand people there. Um, it didn't do anything for my mood. I no, I didn't. <laughs> it made me walk quicker to the train station. Um, all right, let's get into listener questions. Red Jacket says, interested to hear the panel's thoughts on the booing of Luke Jackson. I thought it was interesting that the first time he got the ball, there was a mixture of boos and clapping, as B-Man pointed out. I was not expecting clapping, and despite the fact that he abandoned us, he is a premiership player. Uh, during the week, there was a poll on Demon Land uh, uh, asking the question of, would you boo Luke Jackson? 75% said no, 19% said yes, 6% were undecided. And as much as I loathe the fact that he left after after three years of development and only dealt with one WA club who didn't have the best currency available, you know, it's the flag that he helped uh, deliver and the feelings I have that that bought me, you know, it outweighed the feelings that I have for him ditching us. Uh, I, look, I didn't mind the touch of people clapping. I didn't personally clap, uh, uh, but... Um, there was a guy behind me who must have still had some very hard feelings towards Dogger because he was calling him a dog all day and I doubt he was referring to his nickname. <laughs> and look, I get the booing. I'm not averse to it myself for players that leave us. Uh, the premiership player aspect was big for me despite not loving the way it ultimately played out. B-Man, which way did you fall on? Were you one of the booers? I can't imagine you would be, but were you? Maybe you were. No, I don't boo, <laughs> but I tell you what, I don't clap someone who left yeah. our team. I, I mean, I don't get that at all, were even cl- if it is clapping the to p- counter the booing. People yeah. can boo if they want to. It's not my go, but, you know, it's also not – it's okay to boo a, t- a player who's left on big coin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's let's face it. He's just, I mean, it's not. You know, I, I'd be. I'm happier if they if Boo Jackson. That's part of the footy theatre, isn't it? Like, mm. uh, you know, it's ridiculous to um, boo, uh, boo a player like Horn Francis. I mean, that's just oh, that's totally embarrassing. Particularly totally if, embarrassing. if we were to blame at home, why are we yeah. booing him? Like, he didn't do yeah, anything to but us. But it's forever in a day. Particularly players like Jared Healy, who leaves for coin. You know, he, he abandoned Melbourne Footy Club. I, we don't know him nothing. Mm. I'm not a booer personally, but I mean to cheer him. I mean, give me a spell. It's it's all, all about what we we're talking about before the, the need for passion, and uh, noisy and um, um, passionate people are, are what make the game. So um, yeah, come on, Melbourne fans, lift your, lift your game and be a lot a lot louder. LDA. Yeah, I reckon Melbourne fans are too were too keen to be seen as very even handed and yes, young. You know, he is a premiership hero. I mean. Come on. El Diablo 14 uh, has our coach in his sights asking, when are, uh, when are we going to question our premiership coach or does he get a free pass by merit of 2021? I believe this season is cooked. Can't see any ingenuity or dare from this coach to try and change the momentum of this team. I hope I am wrong, though. If we fail this year, that's already five wasted seasons by Goodwin, 2017, 2019, 2020, 2022 and 2023. Is this acceptable? You could argue 2017, they were too young. 2019, all of the injuries. But what about 2020 and 2022 and this year? Monocular answers, 2020 was a total dog's dinner of a season and a coach cannot be blamed for, in particular, playing in Cairns immediately after a two-hour flight with an hour-plus bus bus trip at each end. Didn't even get a warm-up, then uh, then back-to-back games. Two important losses, as I recall, in the context of finals. 2022, we were cooked after a limited off-season break and some tough scheduling, though we did finish second, but our last legs, fewer excuses for 2023 and he says 2019, but we know there were excuses for that with the off season. At the break of Gorn also asks, uh, do you think Goodwin and the coaching staff have the ability to turn this around mid-season? We're in good health as opposed to 2019 and have a very talented list, which means this is largely a system things. What changes do you think we need to make? Uh, George, does the coach get a free pass uh, because of our drought-breaking uh, premiership? Um, uh 
uh, is El Diablo overreacting about our season being cooked? Uh, do you have the confidence in the coaching and playing group that we can turn things around? And what changes do you think need to be made to our systems to get us back into serious to serious contenders? Uh, I know there's a lot to unpack there, but. Uh yeah, he he absolutely does get a, a free pass for a premiership, um, and you know, based on other coaches in similar sorts of situations, um, that can go on for quite a while. But that's still no excuse. Um, I'm reminded of the Damien Hardwick situation at Richmond um, prior to his premierships. He he was on a knife knife edge there, um, but again, you stick to your systems as long as you've got the cattle there, and we've we've got the cattle like Richmond did when Hardwick was in, in that situation. You need the time to develop. You're not going to go go out and, you know, we've already talked about it, you're not going to go out and win and start the season 10-zip every year. It doesn't happen to to many teams at all. Um, there's uh, – it, it really does – it's it's less on the coach, I've always felt, as opposed to the cattle on the field that produce the results. You can't – you can't um, – to use the old adage, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. But if you've got the silk purse, um, that's when the advantage of the coach comes in. Um, we've got a long way to go in the season. Goody's handling things differently this year um, from what he has in the past. People may not like it. Um, we've talked about the use of the players and the way they're they're being experimented with um, up to this stage, but we I suspect that we're focused on the end of the year, not not at the halfway point. But yeah, it's frustrating frustrating for fans, um, but they better get used to it. B man, uh, you wanted to add something? You're on mute. Oh, yeah, you're off now. Yeah, I, oh, I, um, spot on, George. I mean, it, it, look, it's all about winning the the war, not winning the battles. All of these games are the battles, particularly the ones in the middle. And, again, I've said this the last few weeks or the last couple of weeks with the loss last week, is not each game is an litmus test about our chances of winning a flag. It's about winning the war, not winning the battle. Um, and to be honest, that blows my mind a bit. It's impossible. I, I find it incredible that any Demon fan, um, you know, could could think about, you know, will disregard the fact we won a flag two years ago. I, you know, I find it remarkable that, you know, you know I wonder whether people actually realise sometimes, which I can't believe Melbourne fans would think this, actually understand how difficult it is to win a flag, you know, how hard it actually is. I mean, we hadn't won one for 57 years for Pete's sake. Goody won a flag the season before last. We finished second on the ladder after last season and, yeah, we went out in straight sets, but everyone knows um, some of the information around why, you know, we entered the finals with up to 11 players under an injury cloud and that's how, how we played. We're currently fourth on the ladder, so we're still in the top four. Um, at almost the halfway point of, of this season, almost all teams, therefore, have played each other once. So leaving aside anyone's assessment of where we're at and, you know, be that Demon Land posters or the media, the objective truth of the ladder is that we currently have the fourth best record of any team in the AFL. So how could anyone be thinking about us going backwards or, you know, we've missed our window or, um, you know, and people can talk all they want about our forward line, for instance, and scoring ability. But again, the objective fact is we have a higher percentage than the pies um, and people are still rabbiting on about how, um, you know, the scoring power, how awesome they are, the pies in the scoring. It's incredible. They've won three more games than us. Um, yet we've still got a higher percentage than them. I mean, that, that is remarkable. Three less wins, higher percentage. The Pies have now played one of the two real easy beats in the competition in North, who we get to play again and they don't. Um, and as I say, 11 rounds of footy is more than enough to level out any of the fixturing anomalies that might make a sort of a comparison between two, two cards difficult after maybe two or three rounds. Um, and the other thing about the Pies, eight of their 11 games have been at the MCG so far. I mean, that's a pretty big leg up for, for scoring-wise. You know, you take the Lions, some argue they've got the best forward line in the AFL. After 11 rounds, they've won one more game, and yet we have more than almost ten, we have 10 percentage points more than them, despite the leg up they get playing at the Gabba. And Port, another side who's considered a, um, a, um, a really good attacking side and have a decent forward line, 
They've won two more games than us, yet we're 22 percentage points clear than us. You know I mean, so what measures are people looking at to determine that, you know, Goody needs to, you know, we need another coach or that we're going backwards? Um, against Frio, we got our chances. We just didn't take them, um, which, as I said, the, ex- the ex- expected score had us winning that game. Um, and Goody's made it clear it's not about one flag, it's not about two flags, it's about setting up an environment where we're in contention for a decade or more, the way Geelong have. Geelong won their fl- their last flag before last year under Scott, what, nine, ten years ago? And then there was eight, nine-year gap between them. You know, that's how you set up a team for success, and I'm sure, you know, that's exactly what Goody's um, seeing there. And Cats are, again, contenders. Um, but, you know, some are seriously suggesting Goody lucked out somehow or that, you know, the, the planet's aligned or we need a re- reboot. But it, it's just the objective facts simply don't support that view. They just simply don't. All right. We do have a caller. We're going to go to you now. Caller, you're on the air. Who am I talking to? Yeah, it's uh, Gardo calling. Uh, caught up a few times. It's always good to, to chat. Um, I just wanted to throw something at you guys, just some stats. Uh, just over the last 10 or 11 years, uh, I just went through and tallied up sort of the halfway mark and uh, what the win-loss was of, of each of the teams. And just in, going back to 2011, uh, if we exclude 2020, uh, the first on average had 2.2 losses at the halfway mark. Uh, second had two, third had 3.4 and fourth had 3.5 on average. Um, and no teams made the top four with more than seven losses. Uh, so, and as we know, you can't really win from outside the top four. So would you consider if we didn't finish top four, we've still had a passable year or is it a top four or grand final or bust in, in your opinion? George? I, I think that what, what you're talking about is where they're, they're at the, in the halfway point in the season, and that's exactly where we are at the moment. No, I, I, I also think that you know the, the stats over the to, over the period have proven that you need to finish top four to have a realistic chance. Um, I think the Bulldogs were the exception to the rule in the last ten years, if I'm if I'm correct. But basically, just on on straight statistics, you've got to finish top four. There's a home ground advantage. There's potentially a, a week's rest uh, for two of the sides. Um, we're we're well placed at the moment. We're heading in the right direction. Um, we people are saying that we've got an easier run in the second half of the season. So uh, it's a long, hard season. Injuries will affect various teams, not just ours, but um, we we're positioned as well as we could be um, at this time in the year. So. Um, I think we're well and truly on track. Yeah, I guess I'm just sceptical if we could go a um, sort of three or less losses for the remainder of the season just seems a, a stretch in uh, in my opinion. But not to say we can't do it, just uh, just I wouldn't be betting on it if, if, if that was the case, uh, which, which is what would be needed for us to finish in the top four again. Um, and also, just on the, our premiership year, uh, one thing that I really haven't heard anyone mention is that uh, that season, because of the um, teams being in the hubs, we didn't have to travel very much at all. So I believe that although they weren't in Victoria, they were effectively not travelling every week. Uh, so that would have made it a lot easier uh, in, in terms of um, preparation uh, for the for the season, I guess. Uh, whereas since then, uh, yeah, you have to factor in travel and, and other things, which is, uh, seems to be a factor uh, in our performance since. Well, we did we did travel a little bit. When what did we 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 had that game against the Gold Coast where we flew for the entire day, came back, and then still mm. won by ninety points. We had to travel for the first week of finals, and then we went to Adelaide, then we went to Perth. So we did a little bit of travelling, but yeah, there's no doubt that this year we've <laughs> we've had what have we had six interstate games in the first um, eleven weeks. Um, it's definitely uh, been a factor. And the back half of our yep. season looks so much better. And we've got, I think, six or seven games at the MCG. 
Um, it's a our back half of this season is the opposite to last year in terms of travel. Um, we've we've got some tougher games, but that's okay. Um, you know, it's a much much better draw. It looks much more like Geelong's did last year. Their their fixture. Um, so you know, we don't leave now. We don't leave Melbourne until July to to we play the Giants in um, Alice Springs. Anything else, Scarbo? No, no, that was it. It was uh, yeah, just good, good getting your opinions on that. So yeah, we'll see how we go over the next uh, second half of the season, and uh, if yeah, if we can go on a run like Geelong last year, I'll be very happy. Yep. Uh, if you uh, want to back the D's to miss the top four, you, you're getting you can they're two twenty to miss the top four and a dollar sixty seven to make the top four. So. Well and truly favourites to make it, but if you don't think we can, you can uh, have an insurance bet. I like doomsday scenarios. What are we to miss the eight? Uh, I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> Let's hope uh, that doesn't come to fruition. All right, thank you very much, Garbo. Appreciate it. Give us a call another time. We'll see how we're travelling we're later in the year. Eleven dollars to miss the eight, Andy. Oh, so get that. on it now we'll for take, your MFC. I'll, t- <laughs> I'll take that. Fun. Um, all right, let's uh, get back to uh, the questions. Radelaide says, in 2021 and 2022, our best defensive setup consisted of May Lever and Petty. Obviously, Petty is out injured and prior to that was given key forward duties. Do we need to go back to three tools down back? Flower Magic adds, what is wrong with Jake Lever? Surely Petty's absence from the back line shouldn't make that much of a difference to an elite player's game. Is the change to a more attacking game plan uh, prejudicing his ability to play as an intercept marker or is he just out of form? I think Jake is one of five, our five most important players and his lack of influence this year is very worrying. Look, unfortunately, Jake Lever this week couldn't catch a cold. He, he was uncharacteristically dropping every mark. Probably one of his worst games he's played at the club. I'm sure he would agree. There's no doubt... Uh, you know, us playing one less key tall in defence has changed the way that Lever is used. Um, you know, he's playing more man on man. It takes away his biggest strength, which is his intercept game. B man, do we need to revert to three talls in defence? I know we went small in defence to try and improve our ground ball defensive game, but that seems to have been at the expense of us be and uh, us being not being able to exploit one of our biggest weapons and that's being you know that intercept uh, game yeah i mean it's again i think it's useful to not look at this period of the year as some sort of indication of what the systems and setups will look come grand final day um yeah i think goody's setup is three talls and we struggled in that area lever did have a match he's I mean, he was he's dropping not everything. had a great season and but he missed one critical mark that really was such a critical point in the game and it was that it, not a huge amount of pressure. Mm. Um, he, he, you're right, though. He, without that third tall, you, you're not playing to his strengths no. and the art of coaching is is making sure every player on your, on the field is, you know, maximising their strengths. And if you haven't got that second tall, his strength has never been as a one-on-one defender. It's reading the ball and zoning off and intercepting. And without that second, third tall, it's a real challenge. So um, the other thing is May is still struggling to pick up the ground ball from, you know, from my perspective. And, um, you know, it, it was an interesting call to go in without that third defender. You know, I mean, we've got Tomlinson there. Shaki could have come in. He's played down back for, um, not for us, but he has for the Dogs. Um, Yeah, I thought it was an interesting call. I think, you know, optimally, everyone available, they'll go three talls. I still think Petty will go back. Um, But, you know, they they need three talls back there. I, I think that's sort of the other part of that is that we're still experimenting. People, the other thing that's a curious thing on Demon Land is people accusing Goody of being, you know, too inflexible. He's... You know, he's experimenting all over the place. You only need to look at how we're doing our kickouts now. You know, they're they're so different to how they were last year. Um, you know, the points to where they're they're kicking it, uh, and the defensive setup is just one one thing. I will say about the defence is the biggest issue I think for our defensive unit is our as we've talked about is that medium size forward that cuts us up, like Bailey for Lions or you know Schultz normally. 
Um, but, you know, I, I thought McVie looked pretty flat, but um, I don't know, George, I didn't really watch. Did, was McVie tracking um, Schultz? Whoever it was, we did a good job of shutting Schultz down and um, and li- really limiting uh, his influence. Walters out for them was a big um, mm. a big out, I thought, for that reason because it didn't exacerbate our weakness in that area. But it still really worries me that that role, um, you know, the, of medium forwards getting away from us. I, th- I think the um, the lever problem is simply related to Harrison Petty. That um, yep. in the absence of Petty, lever is expected to do other things which he which aren't his forte. Uh, May is expected to do other things which aren't his forte. Um, we've got a real dearth of um, availability as well. We've tried Tomlinson in there. He's he's not a Harrison Petty replacement by any stretch. Um, Turner may come in, but he's been tried as well. Um, but we, we, what, whatever we do with whatever options are there in the future, they're not Harrison Petty. And um, Petty's being tried up the forward line because we've got a problem up there as well. Um, but it's all about experimentation. So it's not surprising that um, for a team that relied so heavily over the last couple of years on zone defence, and in zone defence, you need to have faith in the others in that defensive system doing their job. And when you take one of those key players out, like we've we've had to, um, other other flow-on effects happen. And uh, I think that's what's happened to Lever. You put P- Petty back there, and I think you'll see the Lever evolve very quickly. Uh, Lazy says uh, the main criticism on on Demon Land seems to be about clearances and centre clearances. Looking at the stats, though, we've beaten Welly Allop uh, in contested ball f- one fifty seven to one forty one, and pretty much matched them in clearances. Are we possibly looking at the wrong areas uh, as the issue right now? Was this game more about the lack of execution, cohesion and clean possession? Need Big Man's take on this uh, because I'm finding it very difficult to figure out. And Big Man, I think you've uh, sort of summed it up uh, that our fatigue caused a lot of, um, you know, the the, the ex- lack of execution, the cohesion, the, the clean possession. Uh, is, that, uh, is that still your contention? Absolutely. And I'd just also reiterate this. You know, go back to the Hawthorne game. It's only two games ago. No one was talking about any of these issues. <laughs> we got beaten by Port in Port and we got beaten by Frio, who are now ninth on the ladder. Port are now, what, third on the ladder. So they're two pretty good football teams. Um, you know, it's, it's yeah, not, but is that a worry? Uh, like Hawthorne, that, Hawthorne isn't. Uh, well, they had a good game this week, but uh, they've been no, down the bottom of the ladder. Game. You expect to beat up on that and have good cohesion, good execution. <laughs> well, I don't uh, mean the Hawthorne you know, game in isolation. I yeah. mean... We were, what, 7-2 after the yeah. Hawthorne game. I mean, come on. There were no problems two weeks ago. But but the, it, it, was, it was said we'd played 16th, 17th, 18th, you know, 15th on yeah, the ladder and we'd beaten all f- them. Uh, the, that makes you know, up part can, of that seven. I'm playing you devil, devil's advocate. Your numbers however you want to look at it. You, you know, like, every again, everyone bangs on about the, you know, the pies and they talk about our struggles against um, top eight sides. Well, if you go back to the start of the 22 finals, the um, the pies have played seven top eight teams and lost three of those games, the two finals and against the Lions this year, and only scraped past the Saints and the Bombers. So the supposedly unbeaten pies, if you go back to the start of last year, finals are not much better than 50-50 against top eight sides in that, in that time. So, you know, I'm just saying you can chop up your numbers however you want. The ladder position is the what the ladder position is, you know. For me, from the the issue from that game is the clearances weren't an issue. They what did they they only scored? I think I said nine more points um, uh, or eleven more points than us from clearances. The big issue was that we um, that our differential on turnovers was so poor, and that's related to how many turnover clangers we kicked. As I said last week, they were eighteenth for clangers um, in the AFL coming into that game. So on paper, it should have really, it really should have helped our turnover game, um, but we were either not putting enough pressure, and so their t- their clangers were um, were lower than what they normally would be, um, and we made too many clangers ourselves, and they made us pay. So though mm-hmm. you know we almost broke even on turnover, where we're normally we're differential, we're looking at a four or five goal differential on scores from turnover. That's that game, you know, that's where we lost that game, and as George mentioned. You know the accuracy. We we turn the accuracy around. We win that game. Um, you know going away. Yeah. The other thing is that 
um, we, we use the same uh, scenario against other teams. It's not the clearances. It's not the contested possessions. It's the quality of the clearances and the quality of the contested def, uh, possessions. So uh, while numbers might be down, it's, it's difficult to judge on, statist- on those statistics alone about what the effects are of those sort of things. And when you're not delivering the ball, even though you've got the ball, even though you might get a clearance, if you're not delivering it upfield accurately, then it's completely um, a worthless statistic to you. So it's difficult to judge those alone. You've got to com- look at the the outcomes um, of, of, uh, of those statistics in conjunction. At the break of Gorn says, uh, teams that like a forward handball game and who lower their eyes get through our defence way too easily. Can this be solved through more pressure through the middle of the ground? Um, I felt, and we talked about the pressure rating, sort of our pressure rating going down in the second and third quarters, I felt that during that period we were constantly under pressure whenever we got ball from stoppages. We were either almost immediately tackled or were under a lot of pressure forcing a lot of those errors that we saw. Uh, we were never able to really get a run and carry game going and maybe the fatigue is part of that. Uh, conversely, I didn't feel that they were under that same amount of pressure, particularly in that middle part of the game. Uh, I didn't think they were under that amount of pressure with ball in hands and they seemed to waltz out of stoppages and were under little or no pressure and able to get a handball game going. Uh, George, you've been watching on the telly, but what do you, you watched on the telly, but what did you think about what uh, at the break of Gorn is asking? Um, um, it, it's difficult in such a such a low scoring game to mm. to um, assess that. Um, every team who who hits targets inside fifty easily, you're always credited with you know they they lower their eyes, they mm. do this, they they do that. Um, it, it sometimes that just happen, happens in the game. A, a, a couple of times I noticed in the replay, um, Fremantle had a free player at around about the 35-metre yeah. mark that resulted in, in goals. Um, I, th- I think it was more the mids not covering that space than the defenders. Um, well, that's what he's saying, uh, you know, uh, yeah, pressure um, through the middle. And if the, mid, if the mids aren't running as hard as what they have been, and this comes back to what Ben Man's been saying about, if you're fatigued and you can't make that extra yard, you can't get to that contest, then these sort of players suddenly pop up and it looks like there's nobody doing the job. Um, that is the truth. There's nobody doing the job because yeah. previously they would have been covered off and it wouldn't have happened. So, um, yeah. yeah. That's a really good point, George. And um, at, at one point, uh, I'm not sure of the percentage of the game that Brayshaw was on the wing, but he was on the wing at one point, and um, they had. Ju- it was in that third quarter when you know exactly in that period you're talking about, Andy, where second and third quarter was such a flat. You know, the the, the differential in the pressure was evident, really evident. Watching, you didn't need to look at see the numbers scrolling across the screen. Um, and Brayshaw is just simply not the same sort of aerobic athlete as Hunter. So I mentioned we miss Hunter's um, kicking mm. inside 50, which is absolutely the case, but we also missed his defensive, you know, arc-to-arc running that he does, um, game in, game out, and it's those players that are filling the holes up on the half-forward flank. Um, but it's a really interesting observation because the same thing happened against Port in that first quarter uh, and maybe it is because Petty's not back there and they're, they're still trying to sort of, you know, get their new system um, for a defensive unit that's been so well set for at least two or three years. Against Port in that first quarter, it, it looked like they're all, they all out of whack with their systems and the Port were able to find free players up on the 50-metre arc at the half-forward flank. Um, there was a little patch in the, this game, the same sort of thing happened, which is what the, the question's touching on, I think. So... Um, it looked a little while. It took it seemed to take them a little while to adjust their their setup in both games, and they, they ultimately did. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe teams are looking to exploit, you know, our structural and system sort of flux that we're in at the moment with with having an unsettled back six. Doug Remus says, oh, well, before I get to that, we've got a few questions regarding our tall forward situation. I'll read them all out and then get uh, both your takes on it. Um, Doug Remus says, our forward line is completely lost. Every contest, JVR and T-Mac and Gorn, if he was there, were 
flying for the same ball and we had no one at the feet of them. I watched the VFL minigame versus Werribee and Smith, Brown and Shackey had better separation. In my opinion, T-Mac is done, has to be dropped and Brown has to come in. He looked to be moving well uh, of what I saw and I think Chandler needs a spell too. What do you guys think? Um, Monocular asks, is there any reason tactically that our tall forwards all converge on the bomb um, and just rarely lead, spread or lead? And our smalls don't wait down front and behind and crumb the spill. So frustrating. Travi14 adds, big issue this week with our tools not separating enough and allowing their opponent to impact the contest as the third man. Kane Corn said he doesn't think we need a second forward. We should just play JVR and Gundy slash Grawn. Gone, uh, which scares me a bit. Is it possible that the continual changing of all of our tall forward setup means there is no connection? Should we be? Should we after the buy set and forget our forward line? D for life says thanks for your terrific podcast. You do a fantastic job. I miss the game, but assuming we lost by a good ten to fifteen goals from the responses on Demonland, we must be out of the finals race. Looks like the following were problem areas. Key forwards, ball movement into the forward line with dumping kicks versus what was happening earlier in the year. Goal kicking, disposal generally ordinary, a number of players down on form, selfishness. Interested on your thoughts, Ray, key forwards, particularly T-Max form and possible replacements, ball movement into the forward line, selfishness versus selflessness. Uh, while sensing the frustration after two close losses, can't the supporter base see what happens to clubs that fire coaches mid-season? It rarely works and they, do, they usually go backwards. Stable clubs have more success. Now, if you look at the ladder, and we may have mentioned it before, it says we're still number one scoring team. However, that could and probably is inflated by a relatively soft draw. <laughs> Bim, you'll disagree. Uh, so far this season. So perhaps it's masking a bigger issue that will now be exposed against better opposition. I think continually changing the forward setup will have the follow on effect of uh, continuing. Sorry. If you continually change the forward setup, uh, it will have the follow effect of there not being connection, but we've got to get the forward set up right. And if it means that we have to chop and change, um, then we have to chop and change to get the right mix. Big man, do, do we have a problem with the way that we're entering forward 50? Uh, are our forwards leading properly? Is it just fatigue? Uh, how, how, do, how can we fix it? Cause well, again, it depends what you're talking about. Like, are we talking about the last two games of footy? Yeah, we had a, an issue with the... Uh, um, except for the fact that we missed heaps of targets. If we hit some of those targets, again, we would have won the game and no one would be talking about yeah. it. So, you know, I, I don't know what, why people are saying, let's take the last two games and apply it to the entire year because it's counterintuitive. Why not take the first nine games and, and apply that to, or the first eight games, I should say, and apply that to, you know, that's a bigger sample size than... The two games, I would say that in terms of that separation, it's related to the speed of ball movement. When we can't move, the, when we move the ball quickly, we create space in our forward line. We get it there before the defence can set up their um, zoning. So um, you know, we get it there quickly. There's more more space. It's just uh, is as it is. But two things is that absolutely, I'm worried about our forward pressure. It's the same bit like last year. Cozzy's been down, Chandler's been down, Spargo's been down. Really, it's only Nibbler who's kept going. Um, keeping in mind this year, we had exactly the same conversation last year, and Nibbler was the only player in our small forward lineup that um, actually improved his ratings during this period. Hunt was the other player. Every other player went backwards during this this phase of of the season. I do have a concern with the forward line because I, it's ironic, really. Last year we had exactly, as we were talking about before, the same um, issue with T-Mac, and I put that on the table. I'm worried if he gets injured, then he gets injured. BB, you know, never really got going. Um, both of those players are struggling. I, I just, I don't know, George, what, what your sort of view of T-Mac is, but he looks, he looks as slow as he has for a couple of years and... Um, to be honest, you know, I said this last week that I thought they pulled the wrong rein not bringing Smith in uh, against Port. Um, I think they made the same error this week. I, I would have preferred to have seen um, Smith in this game. I don't know. I didn't see any of the Werribee game. Uh, I heard, I've heard two different reports about how BB's travelling, one saying that he's looking slow, another saying he's, he's looking all right. My gut feeling is that they're putting him on ice until later in the season so that they've got him as cherry ripe as possible and that they may not be able to get him in that shape if they're playing him now at AFL footy. Um, 
So it, it's really curious. Going back to Garbo's um, point, you know, about this, you know, about the wins and the number of wins to get top four, this is a really becomes a super important match because of the last two um, matches. One, we lose it. That's three in a row. We go into King's birthday, you know, on the back of three losses. But two, you know, it just makes it more difficult if we lose this week to make top four. So it's suddenly become a critical match. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see which way they go with their forward line. I, I just think T-Mac looked, he, he you know, I, I don't want to say it's gone past him, but he, he looks too slow. I don't, what, what were your views on that, George? Um, just a couple of things. Firstly, um, I think people's expectations have got to change about what you what you expect out of a forward. Everybody loves the tall marking forwards of the past. It's not the way play, um, games are played these days. Um, you rarely see a contested pack mark in the forward line for any team. Um, it's just not done these days. So that, that, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing um, was the way we trained at the start of the season. And, and from my observations, every team is doing the same thing is that the kicks are going much deeper into the forward line than what they were last year, um, which creates you know, the idea, obviously, is to get it closer to the goal so that the small, with the expectation that the mark won't be taken. It'll be, it's the exception rather than the rule, but the ball will be brought to ground and your small forwards take advantage of that. I think our problem has been that our small forwards have been underperforming considerably. Yeah. It's not it's yeah. not the T-Mags, it's, it's not the Ben Browns, it's not the JVRs, it's the small forwards who aren't contributing in the same way that they've been expected to. Um, I'm with you. I think they're holding Ben Brown back. Um, he has got knee problems and has for a long, longer time. Um, I... I wasn't as negative about um, T Max game in in this particular one simply because uh, if you look at a few of the goals, um, Cosy was one, Fritch was another. They were only created simply because T Mac made the contest. Yeah, um, uh, uh, don't expect him to be marking overhead, you know, in a pack. Don't expect him to be running up. Yes, he's older. He's not a, not as what he was, but he's doing what we need. And unfortunately, we've got no other options at the moment. That's that's the real well, critical. Shacky. <laughs> and but the trouble is, Shack, Shacky's not a con, not a contested marker. No, in, but in, like, yeah. what what we you're right, exactly right about T Mac. And and as a stay at home forward, he's okay. Mm. Where he's not the same player that he was, not giving us the same value structurally, is he's running up and down the ground. Yeah, and there was a yeah. major contest on the wing that he would have, in his best in 21, he would have won that contest because he would have got there first. It was a yeah. big turning point in that last quarter. I re- if we win that ball, have that contest, we have players ahead of it, we we probably score. Unfortunately, we turn it over on the on the uh, Riverside wing and um, um, they scored and, and that was that ended up being the margin. So it's really that up and down the ground running, which I think Shaki can do. Um, but you're right, his contests were, and it'd be fair to him, he took a clutch contested mark and went back and kicked yeah. it. So I, I think that's a really good point. It's the small forwards who are really struggling. The other thing really I think is it has to be said is that JBR had a shocker last week and, you know, if, if you wanted to be harsh, cost us the game um, with his lack of discipline uh, and had a very poor game this week. Um, now fatigue is going to impact all young players, but I'm guessing it impacts you know, big key forwards more than any. Yeah. So he's probably really struggling um, at this point of the season, probably needs a, a, you know, chop out. So, you know, maybe they need to look at that, but I'm, I'm not sure they don't like to, if they chop, that's what Selwyn Griffith said in that interview. If it's not as simple as that, if they send them back to VFL, they still got to get them up to full match loads anyway. So, you know, cause VFL is not as, um, is not as intense. So in addition to a VFL game, they've got to do additional runnings to get them up to AFL loads. So, um, but he was poor again, I thought, um, on the weekend. And so, you know, that doesn't help our forward line, you know, function well either. There was there was another observation that which was made by Old 55 um, in this game. He noticed that uh, T-Mac and JVR were playing close together for a good part of the game. So, it creates that scenario of, of uh, not marking, but rather trying to bring the ball to ground. But he pointed out that um, 
it was it's like a, a basketball anomaly. Um, you put those two players together with their relative lift defenders, and you release Fritch one on one. And um, Fritch is our best one on one forward at the yeah. moment. Um, so that creates the opportunities um, on the other side of the ground where Fritch is by simply standing next to each other. Um, so it looks horrible from the from the spectator's point of view. We're always kicking to packs becomes the um, the catch cry. But in fact, um, you're releasing your, you're releasing your best forward to do the damage that he can. So it'll be interesting to watch that live uh, this week to see if that's the way they are actually playing. D old fart wants to know what on earth has happened to the manic forward half pressure, which was a hallmark of our game in 2021 and for a good part of 2022. Uh, back then, opposition players were looking over their shoulders in fear of being run down by Cozzy, Spargs or A&B, but not anymore. I hate to say it about our beloved Ds, but viewing from my lounge room in the snowy mountains, it looks like a work rate issue. I'd love to hear the panel's views. Love the pod. Keep up your great work, guys. Um, and believe it or sure, not, sure. We're, we're still third for tackles inside 50. We're six for tackles overall. Uh, B man, is it a work rate problem? Well, uh, how was it? Yeah, right, we sorry, talked about sorry. the pressure ratings for the match and they were high in the first and last. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, Andy. But the, right. the, again, it's sort of, I think there's this thing about looking at the last two games as if it's illustrative of the season because coming into that, we it wasn't an issue. Our forward half pressure, we talked about it on the podcast is that it's improved out of sight this year after it being a major issue for us last year and one that I discounted to a, to an extent. Um, you know, in the first half, people um, were on Demon Land were pointing out that that was a statistical concern, that, yeah, we'd won 10 in a row, but our forward half pressure was down. We had resolved that issue this year. It's in the last two weeks it's dropped off. Um, now, again, going back to Selwyn Griffith, that notion of accumulative um, fatigue, Cumulative fatigue is going to impact, you know, it's just makes logical sense that it's going to impact younger players more than it is older players, more senior players. Who are our young, um, who are our small forwards? Chandler, <laughs> Cozzy, you know, and, and then Spargo. Spargo. And Spargo, three young players. How old is Spargo? What, 21, 22? Uh, 22, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. So it's still a young player. Spy, um, uh, Chandler and Cozzy. So, you know, it go. It makes sense that they would be fatiguing at this point in the season and Nibbler's still powering through because he's, you know, 25, 26 with 100 and whatever number of games under his belt. So, um, you know, I think that that has to be factored in. But up until at the end of the Hawthorne game, our forward path pressure has been excellent this season. Have you not heard of the saying, you're only as good as your last game? I have heard that saying. That <laughs> seems to be the rule of thumb in, in looking at Melbourne. But, you know, so, um, well, in which case, no worries. Then Brisbane can't win the flag. The Cats can't win the flag. The Saints can't win the flag. The Dogs can't win the flag. There's, geez, there's not many teams left. And Collingwood were woeful on the weekend. They only beat um, North Melbourne by 35 points in a in a – the Fox News I read, a dominant display, um, you know, six goals in perfect conditions under the roof at Marvel, only beat North Melbourne by six. They can't win the flag. I didn't watch the game, but did they take the foot off the pedal? They were up by 50-something points or something. Something I don't and know, then I didn't watch it, but I just saw the, you know. <laughs> Watching Collingwood play, <laughs> no thanks. Uh, Bigfoot asks, are we playing one small forward too many? Should we be playing another midfielder that can be rolled into the midfield rotation? So George, um, you know, we've got Cozzy, Spargo, Chandler, Nibbler, all playing small forward roles, but uh, all have different strengths and abilities that they bring to the table. Are we playing one too many small forwards? Do we need that extra midfielder in the mix? Um. I think we need an extra player of some sort is 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 the problem at the moment and um I'm really concerned about the lack of options that we've got regardless um th there's no one standing up at uh, at Casey that really says I want a game um in the forward line or in the midfield um we'll review it later on but um I think Dazzle Davy 36 made a great comment during the week when he said our highest possession getters in the Casey game this week was Shacky, Tomlinson and Ben Brown. Um, where, where are the small forwards that we, we want to replace them? Where are the mids that we want to replace them with? Then They're not there. That was your point last year often, wasn't it, George? Is it's all very well talking about rolling new players in, but if they're not yeah. there, they're not there. Yeah. I mean, if Monet's Wakefield it was the one that you'd think logically, but his, his numbers have not been stellar so far. No, so no. not knocking the door down, is he? 
yeah, I had high hopes for Wo, Wo Woden um, as well, but he's he's the same. Not not knocking the door down that you need to. Bailey Laurie in the middle, the same same situation. Um, you, you've got to get you've got to get big numbers at, at VFL level to be able to challenge. Um, so for the coaches, it just comes to the situation. What's better for us? Let's say a, a fatigued Charlie for Spargo or someone who can barely get a yeah. kick in in the VFL. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned Wowie because there was a lot of talk about the that Wowie was a lock for this game just gone. Mm. Yeah, someone mentioned and that seemed well, they seemed to intimate that they had knowledge that he was going to debut uh, last week or the game against Freo, and he didn't. So no, he didn't. And, and Track said in um, I think it was Track uh, said in an interview a few weeks ago we talked about it, but that Wowie was a lock for round one if he didn't break his thumb. No. Uh, May Stephen May Stephen said, May said, it said in that, that interview. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Gondi, the, you, I think. <laughs> yeah, Gondi the Great asks, uh, what are the one or two stats that are telling of our problems? The last few weeks we have said effort slash pressure, but the last two weeks pressure has been ridiculously elite, so the boys are clearly trying. We say that Goody is being our coached. What is this specifically? Matchups, team selection, game plan, execution. Uh, there is something clearly off, but it's hard to put a finger on it, so I'm keen to get the panel's thoughts if this hasn't been answered yet. And I think we've we've sort of covered that, so big man is there. <laughs> that you're holding us Expected back? Expected score. Just, yeah. Expected <laughs> score, we win that game. Yeah. All right. Kick straight, we win the game. And, and yep. really, is the conversation different? Paper over the cracks, people could say, but, you know, we kick straight, we win that game. So same, same against Port. All right, we'll play our voicemail message from Noah. He's he's submitted this the last few weeks, and there was one week where he wasn't. It, it was noisy, so I couldn't play it. Then last week he called in, and then I didn't play a thing. So I'm going to play it for Noah now. He did call in uh, during the week, so here you go, Noah. Hi, this is Noah from Bentley. Love the podcast, guys. Just two questions I wanted to pose um, is in regards to James Jordan. Um, because of the elite plays that we have in the midfield and the surplus, I have a feeling that he will go to another side next year just due to the lack of opportunities. Wanted to know what the team thinks about that. And if so, um, what do you think we could do to stop him from going to another team? Could we put him in another position or play him somewhere in the forward line? The second question is I'm a little bit worried about our tall forward structure with Ben Brown and Tom McDonald clearly injured and, you know, being a bit older, not as fit as they used to be. Just out of curiosity and just a, a different question that I normally ask each week is who do you think potentially next year we could get uh, as a tall forward that we could afford that's out of contract and that's of, you know, not too older age, but, you know, mid 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 twenties that we could consider trying to poach now that we're considered a club of uh, repute that where people want to come and play. Love the podcast and this George and go D's. He's back. Um, in regards to, to JJ, and we've noticed noted it on the podcast the last, uh, well, we've said it many times this year, you know, he's put off uh, contract talks until the end of the season. He's been used as the tactical sub a lot this year. He wasn't brought into the 22 as a result of Sparrow's suspension the other week. He, he was sub again this week and James Harms, who had been playing in the twos, came in ahead of him. Obviously, they wanted a bigger, stronger body uh, with more experience. He's probably a walk-up start in a lot of other teams in the league. I, I certainly, and we've said it before, that wouldn't begrudge him seeking starting 22 opportunities elsewhere at the end of the year. Um, uh, it'd be a shame to lose him. And I, I think we have tried him in a number of different positions, but at the moment his value really lies in his ability to be used as that tactical sub because he can slot into a variety of positions as that sub Um and in regards to our forward line, uh, we've spoken about that tonight, so uh, that pr sort of probably already answered your questions. And I, I guess it's probably too early to to talk key forward targets. I, I have no idea who actually who's available. I think we should have a crack at any decent forwards that are available. Uh, George or B-Man, do we know any key forwards that are gettable? I think George Yardis, who's done his knee, um, is available, um, but he's a Western Australian, so I don't know what's uh, who's, who's there out was there. There was actually an article in the paper, I can't remember, in, in the age this week or last week, 
um, talking about um, exactly this. Um, and there they came up with, oh, oh that's right, the article was about, around Patrick Cripps, um, who may not play a final ever for Carlton at the age of 29 already. What a shame. And they said, and they and they said the danger is for Nick Larkey from North Melbourne, the same situation that uh, I think he's 26 at the moment. Um, North Melbourne is not going to play finals or is certainly challenged for a premiership in the next five years. Um, just looking at their list and their circumstances, things like that. And the, the writer in the article suggested that he would be the ideal play, person to come, come to Melbourne strong forward. It's ex- almost a repeat of the Ben Brown situation um, uh, that uh, enabled Ben to come across to us. So, yeah, th- I, I think that uh, uh, here we are halfway through the season talking about trading. Uh, <laughs> it's a that's it's demon land for you, but um, I think someone like like Alaki would be one of our very first focuses, and I think people need to get off the the bandwagon of trying to manipulate draft picks. We we need to trade this year more than we need to to get picks in the draft, and and that's exactly the sort of player that we need. And we've got a whole series of other players who are at and around the thirty mark that are going to be going in the next couple of years. Um, and we need to be doing the same sort of scenario that we've done to get people like the Levers and the Mays um, and the Ben Browns into the side to fill our needs. So, um, yeah, I, th- I think we'll see a lot more trading this year. But surely Larky for North would be off the table. I mean, I know they would love a low that's, that's pick. Whether, that's whether Larky wants to be off the table yeah, or not. And, what's uh, his con- do you know his status? Is he? I, I think he's actually out of contract at mm. the end of this year. I'm, I'm not positive on that, but I think that's... Um, that was suggested in the article, but mm. why would you want to stick around for another five years when you're 26, um, where you're going know. nowhere? All right, I mean, where do, we, where do we sign? He's exactly, he's exactly the player that um, you know that we'd need down there. So he, he kicks would be bags perfect of goals. Replacement, for instance, for T Mac, <laughs> he's a brilliant mark, great competitor. I love the fact that he's a super accurate kick for goal. He um, kicks bags but, of goals. We have no player who kicks bags of goals. Well, yeah. Well, we Frida don't. Is, oh, well, in the grand final that. six, all right, I'll take that. But, uh, but, but yeah, yeah, he's a he's a goal kicker. That's right. I'm talking um, about JBR six goals, five goals. Kicker. He's kicked mini bags. Um, but yeah, so he'd be, but why would North Melbourne give him up, even if he's out of contract? Exactly like George said. I mean, North Melbourne are about the future. This is a good example of we've actually got a relatively young list. And so back to my point about Goodwin trying to create a team that's successful for a decade, not successful for one or two years, there's lots of moving parts for that. We've got a lot of our key players locked in. Um, but, you know, Steve May's approaching 30, T-Mac's um, 30. Um, and so we, we definitely need cover for them. Larky, why would North want to give up Larky? Well, if, we can trade them a pick. The, you know, they want to be winning a grand final in six or seven years. Larky's not going to do that for them. Yep. So, you know, um, they may find it advantageous to trade Larky. You know, think about that trade of Kelly to um, Geelong. Uh, sorry, from Geelong to, um, West, Coast. to West, West Coast. You could mount an argument to say that that's why they won the flag. They got, you know, they just pay well, well and truly overs for that. West Coast, which allowed – it's a bit of obviously a different situation, Geelong and North Melbourne, but that finally gave the Cats some draft capital, gave them some picks that they've um, done super well at um, using. North Melbourne may well be more interested in draft picks than yep. holding on to a larky. Well, look at us. We paid – people said, oh, we paid well over for May and Lever and look, delivered us yep. a premiership. That's exactly exactly right. Yeah, that's, exa- that's a good – that's a, a, a good scenario uh, – sorry, a good example. All right, let's get uh, Casey. We'll just give a quick review. After three riveting quarters of footy, Casey will dealt a crushing blow to their hopes of repeating last year's premiership glory when they capitulated to the Werribee Tigers in the final term, ultimately losing by 28 points. Adam Tomlinson worked his butt off in defence, amassing 29 touches and eight marks. Ben Brown only had the one goal but took seven marks and had 19 disposals. Melksham and Shackey and Smith all kicked two goals. Well, Woden Howes had 18 and 17 possessions, uh, respectively. So that um, is the 
uh, Casey game uh, training. Uh, D Milan, uh, the, yeah, go sorry, ahead. You've got Andy, something the, to add. The to unfortunate that? thing is, I think White and Munro dominated the the contest, contested possessions again. Well, they're not and, available, are they? <laughs> yeah, and they're not available. We had fourteen players, um, listed players playing in that game, and you got two VFL players um, playing in the middle who are exceeding our current AFL play listed players. So mm. that's a real concern to me. It, it, maybe, but just a, just a, a point there is that for the AFL players playing in the VFL team, fatigue is just a big an issue because as Selwyn Griffith said in that interview, they have to keep the loads up of all players to AFL le- level. So it's sort of no one's fresh coming in. There's no freshness because they've got to run whatever the kilometres, the load that they would do in a match and in their training has to be matched for all players. So, you know, no one's fresh down there kicking the daisies and running around like a spring lamb. They're all exhausted. And the VFL players aren't doing that same sort of um, distance. I'm positive. I very much doubt a, a Munro's running the sort of clips, uh, kilometres that um, the AFL players are. Uh, training Demon Land track watcher Kev Martin ventured down to Gosh's Paddock to bring us the following training pro- report from today's session. Oliver was with the main group, as was Grundy. Uh, those doing their own warm ups included T Max, Spargo, Hibbard, Fritter, Ben Brown, and, and Joel Smith, all in runners except Ben Brown. Rehab is uh, Kay Turner. Spargo, Ben Brown, Jay Smith, and T Mac then joined the main group, and then Hibbard joined as well. Shaki was in the main group. Petty is doing his own program. Uh, I then asked uh, Kev, is Oliver doing everything the rest of the group is doing? If you didn't know he was injured, would you suspect anything? He replied, yep, though it is only a short session. He is also doing small distance ball handling with Moniz Wakefield after all the players have left for the sheds. I saw him feel the back of his hammy early in the warm-up uh, like a test, but didn't do it again during the session. So not much to take away from that report. It's great to hear that Clary is further along in the rehab process than what you would expect from a grade one strain or tear. They're saying it's more of a strain. Uh, a mate of mine did see Oliver doing run-throughs at about 75% pace at Gosh's on Saturday before the game. He said he looked unhampered and looked like he could play the next week. Uh, that was just a random observation, of though, so take that with a grain of salt. I, I can't see him playing this week, but King's birthday is probably a very real possibility. Um, so we'll get into oh, B man you want to add something there? Firstly, just a shout out to Kev Martin. Yeah, it's fantastic. I'm, I'm Mondays. Just loving his, um, <laughs> yeah, I love the track watch. It's fantastic. And, you know, that little detail that <laughs> Ollie, um, you know, felt for his hammy. Was it the right one? Does it? Did he say which one he it didn't, was? I, but know, I assume that, it's the one that's no good. <laughs> yeah, I could feel like I was there. And um, those Monday sessions one, are just very short, half an hour, 40 minute sessions. Yeah. yeah. Well, two comments. One about Oliver, it just seems insane that he's doing anything. Who knows? The second thing is in paging Weber, so Demon Land poster Weber, who's a um, terrific um, uh, poster. Well, he's um, a physio, I believe. Or, he's a physio, yeah. medical yeah. background. Um, so, you know, I'm putting my Weber hat on to say there's no distinction between a tear yes. and a strain. Well, a strain right. is a tear. Yeah. So <laughs> it's like, the, you know. But it's, it's like very the, uh, mild. Strain slash tear. Well, he's made this point a million gazillion times that I've read on Demon Land. There is no mild. It's either strain or it's not, and it's a standard three weeks out if it's uh, any, it's a tear. So, you know, yeah. he also makes the comment about like a hamstring, quote, unquote, awareness. Well, he said so. you can come back earlier, but it increases the risk of re-injury or doing further damage. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's a we calculated risk. That, yeah. Uh, just a, no. just a couple of things, Andy. Did you say Joel Smith was in the rehab group? Yeah, but it, 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 it he then joined That's the main group. That was else to go I said. <laughs> this, this is Kev, a reserved seat there. This is Kev's observation. There, there are those doing yeah. their own warm ups, including T Max, Bargo, Hibbert, oh. Frida, Ben Brown, and Joel Smith. But some of those guys then joined the main group. Frida didn't, but apparently, as Kev has mentioned every week, that's what Frida Frida's his foot, obviously. Um, yeah. Load management, and I say load, not in loading, but loading on the foot. They're obviously not training him. Uh, like yeah. uh, if you remember, I interviewed um, a Vandenberg a few years ago, and he never tr- yeah, he yeah. had the foot issues, and he never trained because because of his foot. So I assume that Frida's in a similar 
on a, in a similar boat at the moment. Uh, just, just, on, yeah. just to confirm uh, what Bin Man was saying about Weber, who's a physio, I heard a um, an interview with the Footscray uh, Western Bulldogs physio some years ago now, and basically uh, she said uh, hamstrings are two weeks um, to repair themselves and they always had add the extra third week um, to ensure that re-injury doesn't occur. Um, so for Oliver, um, you expect three weeks, which puts him at or around the uh, the King's birthday game, but you're not going to see him this week. There's no yeah. way that, that, that any physio would allow him even onto the track. Well, they have allowed him onto the track, but not the, not the field. <laughs> well, onto uh, that track, the MCT uh, track. Yeah, a different track. Uh, Just the point about injury, I noticed one of the flag is that, like, it's easy to forget, you know, talk a lot about fitness, but uh, injury really is, you know, is the key, um, you know, for any of the contending side, they've got to have a good run with injuries full stop. Yeah. And on the injury front, let's not forget track um, you know, he was hampered coming into that port game with his foot problem. So it's another foot problem when you're away, George. He um, Right at the very end of the Hawthorne game, in fact, right before the siren, he got his foot caught and stamped on and he was in doubt for the port game and um, barely went to a centre clearance in the first half. It looked hampered. Um, Frit has been hampered with a foot all season, what, missed the first three rounds. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, with Salem has only now come back, went straight back in, George, at no VFL game, straight into the port game, is yet to get fully up to speed. Uh, I believe Max hasn't looked 100% since coming back from his MCL. Steve May still seems to be struggling with the ground ball and I reckon has some sort of lower back, you know, calf, t- sorry, not calf, um, you know, a glute uh, injury. Um, and then you have... You know, losing Lever and Hibbard right before, um, you know, within an hour of the game starting. Um, you know, of course, and now Petty, we um, missed Petty, was a huge out. So, you know, we've had a pretty tough run with injury um, this year that, you know, needs to be factored in into how we're going, I think. George hasn't been on the moon. He has had internet access, so I believe he's probably <laughs> across all these things. <laughs> but it, it is. It's, it's, it is the biggest single factor. If you haven't got the players on the field performing at their best, don't expect the same sort of results. And um, uh, put, put all these things together. With, with all of those players that we mentioned, the critical players, in yeah, the side, the best ten, the, the yeah, top, best top ten yeah, players, absolutely. Your your prime ruck, your prime um, uh, backman, your prime midfielders are both both out. No no club could perform um, with those sort of injuries on, um, at, under any circumstances, and we have. We're yeah. still sitting in top four. Let's get into changes. Lockie Hunter is a lock to return this week from his one-match suspension. Uh, as we mentioned, it's unlikely that Clayton Oliver will, will return this week, so calm the farm on that one. Uh, before I ask for your changes this week, Singer asks, is it time to roll the dice and give some of our young and up-and-comers a shot, Howes, while we seems we need an injection of some young blood? Uh, I think George, you've answered this one. <laughs> it's no one at uh, K- uh, Casey has been setting the house on fire, <laughs> lighting yeah, and, it up. The... And, and I'll ask the second question. Where would you inject house and why are we into the side? Well, isn't that while yeah. he's been a, on the wing and house has sort of yeah, been yeah, in the yeah, wing yeah. and that's okay. where Lockie who, Hunter's who, coming straight back in. <laughs> inject out? So, you know, it, it's, it sounds good and it's always, you know, we need to bring some young blood in and all the, the people keep bringing up. They've got to they've got to be better than someone else in the side to mm. to justify it. And at the moment, they're not. All right. So I'll ask uh, now who's who's coming in, who's coming out. Uh, Lucky Hunter's obviously in. Uh, uh, Harms out or or Jordan? They, they seem to be the five. You know, uh, the out Lifo, the last in first outs. This would be tough to drop Harms. I mean, I was surprised to be honest. They they brought Harms in. Mm. Um, I wouldn't. Have, oh well, you know, I I. I would have gone with Harms as sub and Jordan as, um, um, you know, starting in 22. But you're probably right, Andy, is that they, you know, maybe for the fatigue factor, they wanted a seasoned, more seasoned footballer to come in and, you know, to offset the that sort of accumulative fatigue that Selwyn Griffith was talking about. But you could hardly drop him top the charts on the pressure. Was our, you know, most impactful player in terms of effort. Um, made some mistakes, but, you know, generally... Uh, had a good game, so it would be pretty tough to drop him. So you think it's 
um, Jordan coming out. But, um, you know, I personally hope they make um, the change and bring Smith in. I'm not sure how he played. He kicked two goals, I heard you say, um, against Werribee. So uh, I'm not sure where his numbers were. You know, hope maybe not enough to bang the door down, but I'd personally love to see him come in up forward. Um, you know, unless they bring um, BB in on the back of 19 um, possessions, which is a good number. Um, so, you know, I still think they'll wait till after the bye for him um, and, you know, even to around 14, 15 before they bring him back. So changes, Hunter in, Jordan out, um, and I'm hoping T-Mac out for Smith. The other possible has to be uh, Chandler, given that he was subbed out of the game. Yeah, and didn't he's had a pretty flat couple of weeks as well. So Yeah. Yeah, early in the season he'd kick goals in every game, but I don't think he's got on the scoreboard in the last couple of weeks. All right, uh, let's move on to the preview versus Carlton. The D's face Carlton on Friday night on the big stage. The Blues well and truly have their backs to the wall with their coach probably one or two bad losses away from cashing his last check at the club. They have a string of injuries from last Friday's night's match with George Hewitt out with concussion, Nick Newman suffering a hamstring injury, Ollie Hollands a shoulder, shoulder injury and creeps under a cloud with an ankle injury, although I think he will play. Adam Chera copped a one-match ban for a dangerous tackle but the Blues are bringing in their lawyers to work his magic at the tribunal's uh, appeals board. Uh, surely he doesn't get off as this is exactly the type of tackle that the AFL are trying to stamp out of the game, but the Carlton lawyer will surely use his Jedi mind tricks and, uh, well, who knows what will happen from there. Uh, George, surely we can't lose this one, but if my MFC SS is accurate and you know that it always is, this is exactly the type of game that we lose. We always play teams back into form. And I just know that Harry Mackay will not miss a single shot on goal this week. He'll, he'll kick him from everywhere this week, from the boundary, from 50 metres out. He might even kick a drop punt from 10 metres out directly in front uh, this week. Um, uh, can we lose this match? <laughs> Absolutely agree with all of the above, Andy. This is exactly the sort of scenario that, that we've seen happen too many times in the past. Uh, you know, with all those players out, it sounds a bit like the Port game when they didn't have Charlie Dixon and, and who was the other one, but, um, their other yeah, forward. Rioli oh, was out as well and all Georgie Yeah, yeah, is, is yeah. yeah. Any, missing yeah. all these players and they probably turned around and beat us. Um, it, it's Look, the, as, as Ben Man said before, this game is really critical to us. Um, we can't afford to lose three in a row going into the King's birthday game against the top of the ladder side. Um Carlton are not playing well whatsoever, um, so we've got we've got our chances to do it. But it will be the same same as the game against Fremantle. It'll be a scrappy game. It'll go right down to the wire, the same as it did um, when we played Carlton last year and uh, just before the final series. Um, they've got some really talented players still in their side, um, so yeah, it will be very difficult. But I think what we will we will know the outcome of this game within about five minutes of the start of it. You know, if Harry Mackay suddenly kicks three goals in the first quarter, that'll be the result of the game. <laughs> that'll be the result of the game. Their tails will be up, and you won't be able to stop them. And Kerno is um, a very good player. He takes yeah, a very yeah. good mark. If if we get on top in the first five minutes of the game, um, and and start to flex the muscle, they will fold. Um, so. Um, it's a difficult game for us, very difficult game. We've, we've got a lot riding on us. We lose this game, we'll potentially we could start dropping out of the eight. Do, do we need, uh, just while I'm thinking about it, you, you've, got, you've got Mackay and Kerno. Um, I know that, uh, what's his name, Silvani was dropped last week, so I'm not sure if yes, he's going to come back this week. Is he got a, the, Is he in the team? Because do we need a third tall uh, in defence? I don't think May and Lever... I can cut it I, with, I, with Hibbert. I wouldn't, as put, a, I wouldn't put Lever on Kerno, for no, example. Well, I'd, be using, uh, I'd be using a Hibbert instead. Yeah, yeah. And then and um, Mays a great match up for... Um, for Mackay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In fact, I think that's a perfect for um, May because it won't stretch him in terms of the ground ball as much. And Do you think Hibbert can, uh, can take Kerno? Well, it can up the ground if they do handoff and he's sort of moving up the ground with him. Maybe not inside 50, you know, deep. 50, but then there's a pack anyway, so. Yeah, fantastic um, grab at the ball. Um, yeah. Well, who would they bring in? It would I have don't to be know. We don't Tomlinson. have Petty. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh no, Disco Turner. Oh, I mean, Disco, Disco Turner. Yeah. Show he played this week, but he played brilliantly um, the previous w- VFL. Game, wasn't so. mentioned in Casey's re- in Casey from Casey's yeah. report. So. Right. Yeah. I wouldn't like to put turn. I wouldn't like to put Lever on Turner. Um, sorry, uh, Lever on Kerno. No, because no. Kerno is very right. powerful, and I don't mm. think you need to put a put a Turner on Kerno for the same reason. Mm. And and it. it detracts from Lever's game even further. I think you need a, a harder, tougher body, and Hibbert's the closest, although he'd be giving away a bit in height, mm. but he's the closest that we've got. Yeah, I reckon that's a good call. I mean, it's a, I, I expect a, a scrappy game, and so I think it's a da- major danger game. Um, you know, it's going to be slippery again, Andy. So another night game where it's going to be slippery. Uh, how, is it going to be um, raining? I haven't done my weather check. I'll keep going. The way Carlton are playing, it's interesting because – they look to have lifted our game plan from 2021 where it's kick the contest, kick the contest, you know, you know, get it down, territory still but not with that sort of rapid movement and, you know, they tried that a little bit on the weekend, just gone and, it, you know, they look all at sea but, um, you know, they're, they're a contest first team and, um, you know, they've got the bulls in the midfield um, that, you know, Cripps, it's interesting. I mean, he's so slow off the mark. He got really cut up by the, the Swans. So watch, the, watch that game. So, you know, the, they're meat and potato contested if, if we're not up to it, you know, in terms of the pressure and the contested ball, they'll have an edge there. Um, but, you know, you know, we should have the edge overall. Um, a, a huge game and, again, I'd urge all Melbourne fans to get there because it may well be the difference. If we can, you know, uh, you know, I would hate to go to Carlton Melbourne. It's our home game and if, you know, if any past history is anything to go by, it'll be feel like there's more Blues fans there mm. at our home game and, um, I, you know, I hope that that doesn't become a deciding factor, um, you know, in winning or losing. Uh, Friday, cloudy, high chance of showers, most likely in the afternoon and evening. Winds north to north easterly and light increasing to 15 to 20 kilometres during the morning, then becoming northerly 20 to 30 kilometres during the day, 18 degrees. Uh, possible rainfall, zero to one millimetre, chance of rain 70%. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. Love, lovely night out. Yeah. So don't if you were if you were thinking to go to the footy and that put you off. <laughs> well, don't blame well, me. Ignore it and just come. <laughs> I'm not the weatherman. Um, oh my D says at this stage in 2022, the Cats were sitting at seven wins and four losses, the same as our record this year. Uh, they went on to never lose a game for the rest of the season. Just how important is it for our season to win at least one of our next two? If we lose to both Carlton and Collingwood, we'll be heading into the bye with seven wins and six losses. Can our season be salvaged if we drop four in a row? It's uh, hypothetical. It's, so yeah, look, it does go the point about those. You know, each in. If it's a series, if it's battles to win the war, you've still got to win your battles, and we've lost our last mm. two battles. You start losing any more, and then you know, using a war analogy, it sort of does end up impacting your campaign a, a fair bit. So, um, yeah, big game Friday night. Um, all right, let's uh, leave it there. Um, uh, we'll be back next week. We've got to discuss what day it is because it's a big man can't do Monday night, so it looks like it's going to be Tuesday, which might not be a bad thing because we can then focus on the uh, preview, a more in-depth preview for the King's birthday. Um, if you want to listen to the show live then, please join us at demonland.com probably on Tuesday night. Uh, thank you to our five-star reviewers at a Petro Newport 34 and John H from Facebook. Thank you to our voicemailer Noah from Bentley. Thank you to our caller Garbo. Thank you to our Demonland posters who submitted questions and comments. Thank you to Red Jacket, El Diablo 14, Monocular, At the Break of Gorn, Radelaide, Flower Magic, Lazy, Doug Rema, Travi 14, D for Life, D Old Fart, Bigfoot, Gaundy the Great, Singer, and Oh My Ds. And thank you to Kev Martin for his uh, training report. Thank you to my co-hosts, uh, George and B-Man. And welcome back, George. And thank you to you, our loyal listeners. Uh, don't forget to leave us a five-star review and a comment on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast from, and we'll read it out on the next show. Uh, see you next week. Go Demons. Go Religious.